Another of the paradigms that, that we have included in our mindset uh, is, the, is, the, is the following. Um, it's about Jesus building his ecclesia, his church. Um, that thought has changed so much the way we do things that uh, we still are in the, in the process of understanding and, uh, and, uh, and applying it. You see, Jesus is who's building his church. I, the Lord spoke to me that at the beginning when he told me whose church is it. But, but the church has to take the church <laughs> to the kingdom of, or, or the kingdom of God where the darkness is. So we don't exist for ourselves. We exist to be manifesting the presence of God where the darkness is. And sometimes it's not difficult to define where the darkness is. Uh, what we, we've been hearing, what is happening, is in the news. The news are telling us where the darkest places in the city are. And then they're, 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 they're not only showing us the darkest places, they're showing us what's going on. You talk to the government, they will tell you. You talk to maybe the neighbors and they will tell you. So what we needed to add, uh, to ask to ourselves is why are we not there yet? Because we know what's happening, we know what's happening, we know how people are suffering, but we're not there yet. And, and that, that's, that's, that's part of the reason that we started to, to, to develop. Now you know the Bible, uh, upon this rock the Lord says I will build my ecclesia. And uh, if you think about it, I, I, I would like to go through to the, to the part of Scripture because it's, uh, it is very exciting to me. It's uh, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Yeah. This is a general question. Who do they think I am? And everybody started saying what they think he is. And, of course, we know the answer, right? right? Some of them say... You're John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then Jesus becomes personal. And what Jesus does is, but who do you think? You want to change it, please? But what about you? He asks, who do you say I am? And then, the way I see this verse is when Jesus asks this important question, the way I see it is that Peter didn't answer the question. The one who answered the question was the Father. He used Peter, but the Father answered the question. Now, just, just think about Jesus saying, who do you think I am? And then the Father answers through Peter. To me, that was a, a very special moment in Jesus' life. Because the father was saying, this is the time. The, it, it, it was, I believe it was for Jesus, it was something like, wow. The father is speaking through this man. And he made it clear to this man, he said, Peter, you didn't have a, <laughs> a clue what you were saying. This wasn't revealed by flesh and blood. It was revealed by my father. And then I think, if I can get it, Jesus' mind in this part of the Bible, then that's what Jesus said, this is the moment to declare part of my mission on earth. Because after that he says that, then Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not your answer. <laughs> it was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but it was the Father's answer. So that's when Jesus said these famous and, and extraordinary words, uh, when he says, I also tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock himself, I will build my ecclesia, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is a strong relationship with his ecclesia and Hades. Gates. You see? Now, if you think about principles like this, and, and you think, okay, we are the ecclesia, we are the church. How close are we are? to the gates of Hades. And I, I'm talking about Juarez. And we got as far as we could from the gates of Hades. And we got involved in our own four walls. 
the process when we when we experience the violence, the Lord forced us to get out of the four walls and go to the gates of Hades and be the ecclesia that He's building right there. I'm not saying that that's not His ecclesia, of course, but this is the training camp. This is when we take care of our wounded soldiers. This is where we prepare our soldiers for what to be there in the marketplace, and in the marketplace in the places where the gates of Hades are. There's a, there's a strong connection between Ecclesia and gates of Hades. So when we started understanding that, we started saying, okay, if we want to be his Ecclesia, <laughs> and it's the same principle that we talked yesterday about, th there's no need for more workers. We want more, more workers so to go to more fields because the fields are ready. But the workers that we have now are sufficient to go to the fields that he's sending us. So it, 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 it makes a connection. Ecclesia, gates of Hades, workers, his fields. Where are his fields? Where the gates of Hades are. So we learned and we started, think, we, we started learning that this is not where our work is. This is where our training is. This is where we became a family. And we pastor and we service and, and we do what we do. But again, for what reason? So... <clears throat> So there's a funny thing also, if, if, if you see the phenomenon of the whole thing, Jesus says, I'm going to build my ecclesia, and then he only mentions, mentions the ecclesia two more times, and that's it. Now, if you think about it, you say, uh, uh, wait, Jesus says in this exciting moment in his life where the Father answers the question that he's asking right in front of everybody, and then he says, the, he says, I'm going to build my ecclesia. And he only mentioned it two more times, and that's it. Now, if you're going to build a building, or you're going to build a ministry, or you're going to build an ecclesia, shouldn't you talk about the ecclesia maybe a hundred times? Think about it. When Jesus told us what the ecclesia is, how he should function, what would be the goal, the motives? We don't find it. We don't, we don't have verses that say, okay, this is the ecclesia. You're going to organize this way, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and you're going to do that. He doesn't mention it but just about two times. The big question is, why? You know why we believe? Because he didn't need it to. Because everybody understood what the ecclesia was. Now, most people think that Jesus invented the term ecclesia, but actually, the ecclesia started 500 years before with the Greeks. The Greeks, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, part of this world. These people, I don't know why, it must be the grace of God, but these people were so intelligent, so wise, that all of the things they wrote, my granddad studied them, my dad, I studied in school, my children studied in school, my grandchildren are going to study in school, and my great-grandchildren are going to study Aristoteles. Plato, and all these guys. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm not saying that I agree with what they say, but, but this, this, it is that type of culture. Well, these people, the Greeks, are the ones who started the whole idea of democracy. Way, way, way advanced on their times, because in the times of the Greeks, we had monarchies, kings, emperors. We didn't have democracy. But these people over there, 500 years before Christ, they were thinking about democracy. They were thinking about how the people should rule themselves and not just one man or one king or whatever. And these guys were so wise that they thought this principle, that I would put it as I understand it, the strongest part of, democ of democracy is the weakest. The place where democracy is the strength, the, the strongest, the power of the people, everybody decides what's best, is this weak, is weakest, a weakest part. Why? Because even though this is a strength, the majority votes, but these people were thinking, what if, if, what if the majority is wrong? So if everybody agrees on something, that makes it right? No, they can be wrong. They can vote for the wrong understanding, but it's a democracy, the people are the ones who design, de de decide. These people 500 years before Christ were thinking 
these things. So, so they, they go into that struggle and then say, what do we need to do? And then they come up with this brilliant idea. They said, okay, let's form an ecclesia. Actually, the right word to, to translate ecclesia is assembly, not church. So they said they form an assembly, an ecclesia, and the job of the ecclesia would be to keep the, the population, to keep the people that are going to be involved in democracy, to keep them thinking the right thing, orthodoxy. <laughs> that was the purpose of the ecclesia with the Greeks. Now, they started developing this. Of course, this is seeds that develop, and you study them now <laughs> in the 21st century. But the next empire that raised up were the Romans, the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, if, if, want, if I can put it in our terms, the Roman Empire had a message, had a gospel had good news. The, the, the good news of the Roman Empire was, was the Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome. And in their message, their gospel, they said, this is the way we're going to bring our message to the people. We're going to create the strongest army, the best in the world, and we're going to go and conquer a piece of land. And we're going to take all these people and then we're going to bring them to our message. We're going to show them our message, our Pax Romana. Of course, that included their authority, their religion, or their gods. It would include their language. It would include everything. So when the, the, when the Romans were doing that, and they, the, and they conquered Greek, Greece, the historians say Rome conquered Greece, but the, the Greek culture conquered Rome. That's why we, we, when, we, when you study world history, you study about the Greco-Roman period in the world. Because, yeah, the Romans took over the land, but the Greeks took over their minds. So when, the, when, when Rome came and took over the, 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 Greeks, the Greeks, they saw this idea of the ecclesia. And the Romans said, that is a great idea. And then they said, we're going to create our own ecclesia. And the Romans create their own ecclesia. This is not the Roman Catholic. This is Rome hundreds of years before Christ. So then the Romans said, we're going to come with our army. We're going to take possession of this land. And we're going to send the ecclesia, the assembly, to mingle with the people, to live with the people, as the, as the, as the Greeks were doing it, and to teach them to speak like we speak, believe what we believe, feel like we feel, speak our language, be under our law. So they were Romanized, the people that they were conquering. And they were doing it through the ecclesia. This cannot be done by arms and, and swords. It has to be done by relationship. Get in the community, do that. Well, when Jesus said, I'm going to build my ecclesia, the people got it right there. Say, so, okay, we understand. The Greeks had their ecclesia. The Romans had their ecclesia. Now, Jesus is going to build his ecclesia. Jesus didn't need to explain anything because people understood immediately what the ecclesia was. Now, just, just if, if, if you go to the more remote part of South Africa, I don't know, a village, the, the farthest remote place, and you get 11 children, and, do, and you tell them, Let's do a soccer team. Let's get a, a football team. Do you have to spend one minute explaining them what that is? They're going to say, yeah, when, when? <laughs> what are we, are we playing? That was, that's, what, that's what happened with the, with the people that listen to this amazing world that are going to build my ecclesia. Now, if you continue to study history, you found out that the, the Romans sent the ecclesia. And, 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 and when, when they more or less had Romanized the culture, then Rome would send ships to these places with building plans, with rocks or stone and wood and whatever, and, and they would have an almirant leading that project. The almirant would get to the place where they just conquered, and they would come and they would build a house where Caesar, their god, when he visits this area, he can go and live there or stay there. That's why we see all, all these buildings all over Europe with columns and the triangle, that Greco-Roman culture. So, 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 so the Almer and the, the one who was leading the project, do you know how they called them? Apostles. <laughs> they called 
They call them apostles. Now, you, you hear the word apostle, you think in our structure. No, no, this is culture. This is secular stuff. So, so, so then they would come and they would build. So Caesar would come and do that. Then Rome says, we're conquering these pieces of land. We're sending the ecclesia. We're sending our apostles. And then we build a structure. We build a house, a temple, if you want to call it. But what about all this land that we have not gotten there yet? Then Rome writes the Conventus Civium Romanarum. You can look it up, hundreds of years before Christ. And the Conventus Civium Romanarum says the following. When we conquer a land, we send the ecclesia, this is our place. We, send, we, we, we crown it with our building where Caesar can come and rule over the area. And the apostles are the ones who do this project. But when we are there, and we, we haven't there yet come to conquer, this is the, what the Conventus said. When two or three Romans are there, the empire or Roman is there. You can read it before Christ. Conventus even Romanarum. So, when, when I understood that, I, I came to this conclusion. Jesus was more secular that we thought or that we wanted to. I mean, Jesus was so secular that he became a man. <laughs> How much secular can that be? Now, in that, in that country, are we, the church, are secular? No, we're not. We have built a wall. We don't love the world. We are apart from the world. We condemn the world. And I'm just talking generally. Of course, not everybody's like that. But that's the general expression. That's why the government doesn't like us. The business people don't want to do business with us. And I'm talking general. So, we, so when Jesus said, I'm going to build my ecclesia, they got it. Now, the ecclesia is the instrument. It's the one who do the job. What, what is the message? Then, you study the word, you found that Jesus mentioned the ecclesia three times. But he mentions close to a hundred times the kingdom of God. That was the message. The message was not the ecclesia. The message was the kingdom of God. I believe, at least in Juarez, I'm for sure, and I believe in a, in, in a lot of parts of the world, the message has been the ecclesia. And we forgot about the kingdom of God. Well, message, Jesus' message is not that. Father, when, when, I'm sorry, when they, the disciples came to the Lord, Teach us to pray. A mighty prayer. Let your church come. No, let your kingdom come. He doesn't even mention the church. <laughs> and that was the prayer. <laughs> when you pray, pray like this. Start with your father. And then ask, ask him to bring his church. No. The church is the servant. The church is the instrument. The church is... Jesus' army to bring the kingdom. So what we learned in Juarez is that we went to the government, to the business people, to the commerce, to whoever, to the education system, we will bring to preach the ecclesia. Wrong message. We are the ecclesia. The message is the kingdom of God. And you know what? The kingdom of God is amazing. The kingdom of God is way, way bigger than our, what we do in our four walls. How many parables do we have, do we have about the kingdom of God? Plenty. The kingdom of God is like, and then you go, you can fill the list. How many parables do we have about the church? The church of God is like silence. <laughs> because everybody understood what the ecclesia was. So, so, so when we started understanding those principles, we changed our mindset. That's why we, we need to change our paradigms. We started seeing ourselves different. It's not about us. It's not about growing our ministry. We want our ministry to grow. But that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is to bring the kingdom, and the kingdom will increase the workers when the, when the, when the kingdom comes. So, so we had to, to change those paradigms. And again, another side of the river, prayer evangelism on the other, and then the water started flowing. 
And let me share what we're experiencing right now after so many years and, and after so many things that have been happening. Well, for, from, from what part, uh, uh, let, me, let me go. Well, this is, this is one uh, thing that we learned. Uh, the Bible has a word in Greek that is tupos. Tupos is what the Bible uses as a model. The, 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 the God told Moses a tupos, a model, to build the tabernacle. And God is into tupos. <laughs> he has a model for everything. That's, that's his story. That's his, those are his ideas. Well, his tupos for the ecclesia is secular. We have made it non-secular. That's why we're so far away from the community, from the culture. So, so God has a, a, a tupos, and, and I believe we, we believe we have to go back to his tupos, the Greek word. And when you say tupos, is, tupos is uh, some, one, some of, the, of, the, of the Greek dictionary, it says the root meaning given a struck by implication sealed, by analogy formed, specially a sample type. It is translated example, figure, form, place, model, signal, term. God's tupos. Is the ecclesia, not what we call church. That's why, that's why when, when, when God opened my eyes about this thing that I would call my church, it, it, it didn't have anything to do with his ecclesia. Now, I was doing a lot of biblical things, but I was building my church. So when you say, forget about your tiny project, I want you to be part of my huge project, the Ecclesia. <laughs> and that's where we started living another. That's where I started loving my brothers, pastors, congregations, denominations, because I understood that's the Ecclesia. That's what I'm part of. I'm not part of my, just my church. So that's got, got, uh, got stupos. Now, let, let me share some of the things we have been... Uh, uh, experiencing right now. Uh, let me just start. I'm just going to skip all that for the sake of time. Okay, this is interesting. This is uh, this is Matthew 28:10. All authority has been given me, so go and disciple nations. At the beginning of the well, at the end of the New Testament, and then at the beginning of the Book of Acts. And then if we go all the way to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelation, there's a verse that it's, uh, it's been triggering me and it's been exciting me and I don't understand <laughs> uh, for maybe the last eight months. But let, let's, let's, let's read it and, and see what you think. Uh, he's talking about the New Jerusalem, the city where the, we don't need a light because Jesus is there. And this is what the Bible says. He says, and the nations will walk in his light and the leaders of the earth will bring her glory to her. He's talking about the city. Her doors will never be closed during the day. There will be no night there and they will bring to it, to the city, the glory and the honor of the nations. I confess that I don't understand totally what that means, but it gives you some light of what's going to happen that day. The nations are going to come before the king to that city. And when I understand nations, what is a nation? People groups, that's the basic definition. Now in modern times, these people groups have boundaries, borders, flags, hymns, constitutions. But within every nation that is built like that, there's a lot of nations inside like I can see here. So, the nations will walk in his light and the leaders of the earth, which I studied that, and it means the leaders of those nations are gonna come to this city. And listen what they're gonna do. They're gonna bring the glory and the honor of our nations to the king in that city. Now, if I would ask you, what are the 
dishonor and the problems and the bad things about your nation, you, you're going to start writing a paper as we do in Mexico, and you're going to write at least 50 points. This is wrong in my nation. This is wrong in my nation. We know it. But what is the glory and the honor of our nation that we're going to bring to the Lord as a nation to his glory? And when I ask this question in every nation I go to, probably 98% of the people don't know what the honor and the glory of the nation is. Do you know? And don't answer me. Just answer to yourself. Do you know what's the honor and the glory of South Africa? The one that we, the ecclesia, are going to be responsible that day to bring it to the king and say, Jesus, this is the honor and glory of South Africa. Here it is. First of all, we don't have a definition of the honor and glory of our nations because we're too much concerned on the bad things. Because we don't have a vision for that day. We have an experience from the past. Secondly, if we know which is the glory and the honor, how much, are we, how much time are we spending as the ecclesia working on that? Zero. We're complaining. We're fighting the battles that the devil wants us to fight, and we're not fighting the fights that we already won in Jesus Christ for that day. So, so we need to rethink how we do church, who we are as a church, what's our, our identity, what is our purpose, what are our roots, what is this all about, the Ecclesia? It's a different... <laughs> The, the brother was, uh, the youth of the pastor was saying, God is going and is doing a new thing. God is always doing a new thing. Our problem is to find out what's the new thing he's doing today. So, if you think about it, Matthew 28, disciple nations, revelations, the nations are going to come to bring the glory and the honor of, of, this, of their nations. What is the missing part? What is the part that we're missing so we can connect both? Well, to my understanding, it's you, it's us. And who is us on who are we? The ecclesia. But his ecclesia, not our church. That's why, that's why I have a problem in my mind, in my heart. And by the way, I, I, I don't have any intention to, to you change the way you call church and, and, and congregation. That's not my... I, I, I just have to be faithful to what God spoke to me. I cannot say that anymore. But that's why when, 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 when we're thinking about the church, that's our job. Our job is, is to bring the kingdom of God, not to bring the church. Our job is to bring glory to the king. Our, our job is to prepare for that day and bring the honor and the glory of our countries, of our nations. But first, we need to know what are the glory and the honor of our nations, and then start working on that, and not only be entertained with the devil, because he's distracting us so much. We need to fight him. Don't misunderstand me. But that's the least important thing. The most important thing is to win those battles so we can take the glory of the nation. That's why. That's why when when we. I was talking that the first paradigm, we need to disciple nations, not only individuals. You see, the, the, the Great Commission is a, is, a, is a coin that has two sides. One side is Mark 16. Go up and preach the, preach the gospel to every creature. That's part of the Great Commission. Preach the gospel to every creature, individuals. We do that, and we do that very well all over the world. The part that we have missed is going disciple nations. Because we don't believe that we can disciple nations. Because it's, we're so few, and how can we disciple a whole nation? So, because we haven't believed God that sent us to disciple nations. Now, to disciple a nation is, is not the equal thing of convert a nation. People are converted, nations are not converted. There cannot be a law that says, from now on, everybody's Christian. Constantine tried that, and it went like this. So what, what we need to do to disciple our natures is to teach our nation to obey what he taught us. That's it. Whether they convert to Christ or not. That's a different thing than preaching the gospel to every creature. But both of them are the Great Commission. So 
This is something that we're working right now. Uh, two months ago, uh, I received a phone call. And uh, they are inviting me to participate in an international event that I believe that is going to create waves all over the world. And uh, we're going to do it in Juarez. And uh, the whole purpose is to disciple nations. Not just one, but few. But let, let me give you the background. Uh, I have about 15 minutes. And I need to talk to, about the Medellin cartel. You see, there are two cartels in the history of drug trafficking. That these, are, these, these, two, these two cartels are the ones who started the whole thing. Cartels didn't exist until the, until the 70s. And these two cartels are called the cartels of the century. Because these two cartels are the ones who conformed the whole idea of cartels, drug trafficking, drug addiction, and creating this huge business that is all over the world and is doing so much damage. No, not one country, but several countries. Well, the Medellin cartel, it started in 1974. And I'm not going to give you too much information, but the, the guy who started this is Pablo Escobar Gaviria. Maybe you have heard of him. Who hasn't? Right now, according to Google, two weeks ago, we knew that there's 220 million hits in Google for the name Pablo Escobar Gaviria a month. 220 million hits a month. They, they, they want to know who this guy is all over the world. This is a phenomenon that is happening right now. Well, this guy starts his own cartel. The first cartel that started in history with the other cartel that I'm going to attack, which is the Cali cartel. The, the Colombia, the, 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 this is in Colombia. In, in the 70s, the largest drug consumer in the world is the United States, what, right now. But in those years, the United States didn't have a, a drug problem. We didn't have a drug problem. You didn't have a drug problem. There were drugs, of course. There have been drugs all over the times in history. But in the United States, talking about the United States, they, the culture that started using drugs, and it was marijuana, some pills, and LSD was the craziest drug. It was in the United States, and it was in the 70s when the hippies came in. But the, it, wasn't a problem, it wasn't a national problem. This, this generation was using drugs to f feel high, talk about love and peace. That, that was the, the, the idea of using drugs. It wasn't established yet, a uh, whole trafficking situation, killing people and all of that, guns and all of that. No, 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 it was something like, like a culture that it was trying to feel fine through drugs. Marijuana, pills, LSD. Well, this cartel, Pablo Escobar, and the other cartel, which I'm going to talk a little bit later, Rodriguez Orejuela, two brothers, they get together and they decide to fill the world of, of, of cocaine, starting with the United States. But in those years, cocaine, it was a white powder that maybe less than half percent of the population knew about. Some people from, from the United States were coming to Colombia to buy the base where they do the, 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 the cocaine. They were taking them to, to the United States and they would sell it to his friends, five, four, five six people. It wasn't a, a huge problem. So these guys, which are very intelligent, they say, let's make cocaine rain in the United States. So they get together, they have a plan, and they say, we're going to invade the United States with cocaine, and we're going to do it to 20 routes, by plane, by boat, by whatever they could. And then, and then they did it. So, so the Medellin cartel decided to do it through Florida, and the Cali cartel through New York. And they started doing that. The most famous of the routes is the one in Florida, where they were profiting every day a million dollars in the early 70s. Profit a million dollars a day, boom, 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 boom. One year, $365 million profit. That was one route. There's a book that said, the men who make cocaine rain in the United States. The problem started, and the United States got hooked. And because of that, that money started flowing all over the world, and now we have the problems that we have here in South Africa. We're not talking America, we're not talking Colombia, we're not talking the state, we're talking South Africa. Listen how this venom has invaded the whole world. So this guy decides that he's going to run for, for a, it would be like a Congress or Parliament, and he wins. 
Why? Because, because in, at the dam where everybody would throw the grass, there were 7,000 families living, and there was a fight, a, flight, a, a, a fire. It, it, they, they, a lot of, the, of that area got burned, and these people came, ended up to be without a home. If you can hold a home, a shack inside of the trash where they would get things and they would eat. So this guy builds a thousand homes, and he has applied to build another thousand and another thousand until he gets to five thousand and give it away to these people so they can vote for him. And they did. You see democracy? <laughs> okay. Another one of the weaknesses of democracy is that people can be manipulated. But if, if, you, think, if you think like the Greeks, the Ecclesi is the one who teaches people not to be manipulated, not to be corrupted, think the right way, orthodoxy, so they can vote the right way. And it's funny because that's our job. That's Jesus' Ecclesia, and we do that through the Bible, to the principles of the Word. But that's funny, even the church by itself is voting not the right way. The church is voting for people who are for abortion. And, and we're the ones who are supposed to be cleaning or bringing sanity to the community. We have to start right here in our own homes. So he gets to that point, and, and when he gets to that point, at that time, he's, the, he's not known as a cartel leader. He's not known, known as a drug trafficker. He knows as Mr. Congressman Pablo Escobar. And he's doing a lot of things. He built 50 football uh, fields in the city. 50. So he was very popular. Everybody loved him. But one of the congressmen who, who was with him, he started saying, this guy is a crook. This guy, where does he get all this money? There must be something wrong. Now, remember, in these times, cartels didn't exist. They were forming. So he, he does that. Pablo Escobar says, I'm a businessman. I'm an honest man. The reason he's saying that is because he's jealous because I am a wealthy man. But this guy, the other congressman, he gets out of Congress and he's elected as the, what would be the general um, uh, deputy or, or anti-corruption, whatever you want to call it. And he comes after Pablo Escobar. And he proves to everybody that he's a drug dealer, a drug trafficker. So what does Pablo Escobar does? He kills him. That was the first Sicario Act in the history of cartelism. He trained people in his ranch. Well, he had, I don't know how many hundreds of properties. He had a zoo in his house. He went to the United States, and one time he bought 50 animals, rhinoceros, elephants, giraffes. And he had a zoo in, 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 his, in, his, in his huge land that he had. So he, he brought these people from, from, from the poorest area of town, the equivalent of townships, and he would put them in motorcycles two by two, and he would send people in cars, and they would have to shoot the cars, and they'd be trained to do that in the streets. So that's the way they killed the, the, the attorney general of the nation. And then he wanted to stop the new thing in Latin America where, where there was extradition authority to get the drug dealers out of the country to be judged in the United States. So he said, I'm not going to allow that. He killed, according to, to, to the statistics, he killed 30 judges in his nation. If you voted for extradition, he would send sicarios and they would kill them. He killed two uh, candidates for the presidency of the country. He bombed 300 police stations with bombs. He would put cars with bombs and he would explode them. One guy. Pablo Escobar. That's why he became so famous. He, 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 he was so bad that, that 40 drug lords from Colombia, that the ones that were coming up and all that, they got together and they said, we need to kill this guy. So we made a vow, they made a vow and said, we're going to stick together until we kill Pablo Escobar. They call themselves Los, 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 Los Pepes. Los Pepes is P-E-P-E, -P -E, persecuted by Pablo Escobar. But they didn't have any money. They didn't have any, any, any intelligent work. So the other cartel, the one I'm going to talk about, the Rodriguez Orejuela cartel, which is these two brothers, this is a different cartel. They're doing the same bad things, but this is different. This is not an aggressive, violent cartel. This is white-collar cartel. One of them has a lawyer's degree. The other one has a lawyer's degree and a business degree. 
These people get a lot of money doing the same thing. They went to New York and they, they bought the, the, the soccer team of the nation, which was the America Club in Colombia. They had the largest chain of pharmacies. They invested in, 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 in media, newspapers, radio. They invested in banks, they invested, invested in real estate, and they became a huge economic power. But the situation was that Pablo Escobar decides not to respect their agreement that he would work Florida and this cartel would work New York. So Pablo Escobar wants to take over New York. Again, territory, that's the problem with, with drug trafficking. So when he does that, both of these cartels start fighting. So, uh, so by this time, the, the, the Cali cartel, which is the Rodriguez Orejuela, they give millions of dollars to, the, to Los Pepes, persecuted by Pablo Escobar. The government gets involved with the cartel of, of Cali, the Rodriguez Orejuela cartel. They get involved with Los Pepes. And with the DEA, they form a task force. The most weird <laughs> group of people coming together to kill one man, Pablo Escobar. They, it took them 10 years to kill him because this guy was so crafty and, and, and he had so much money that he couldn't do a lot of things. So finally, they killed him. But the ones who paid the money, the ones who were in, in the back of all this were these two guys. They're the ones who killed uh, Pablo Escobar. So the situation is, is, is the following. This is Los Pepes. Los Pepes killed more than 300 people if they knew that you were working for Pablo Escobar, they would kill you. Whether you were a lawyer, a doctor, a gangster, whatever, they would come and kill you. And they would kill you and they would put a little paper like that. Los Pepes, persecuted by Pablo Escobar. So uh, one man became the enemy of the whole nation. The people were suffering. One time this guy wanted to kill a, 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 a state representative and he knew that he was taking a plane, so he sent a bomb to the plane, he exploded the plane, killed 120 people, and it turned out that the, 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 the representative never took that flight, he didn't took it. That was how mad madness there was, and how much that bad the situation was. Well, right now, there's about 19 movies and series about this kind of thing, about Pablo Escobar. I don't know if you've seen Sicarios, and there's so many movies, that there is an adoctrination of this cartel thing all over the world. This phenomenon is discipling nations on drug trafficking, on drug, tra on drug, drug trafficking. You see, the, the devil knew what the ecclesia is and he's doing it with his ecclesia. He understood the principle. He has his converts. He has his people working for him, and he has, and the ecclesia is not in a four wall building. His ecclesia is all over the world. They're here, and, and that's, that's, that's why we need to be jealous, because what about Jesus' ecclesia? Where are we? We're all over the world, but we are confined to our four walls and fighting and criticizing the other ones who are in the four walls. We need to change our mindset. We need, and, 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 and I'm sorry, I'm talking generally. I know that there are good congregations, even though they're in the four walls and doing a great and excellent job. But when you see the, the church worldwide, generally speaking, we're not doing a good job at all. Think about denominations and the fighting and, and, and the newspapers. This is a phenomenon that is happening. In the United States, 50% of the Christians are not going to Sunday service anymore. 50%. They, they, they found it out in a, in, a, in a survey that they just put a question on the side and all of a sudden, oops, 50%, and they say, what's going on? So they did a survey to find out the 50%, they, 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 to find out if that was correct or not and why. So they did a whole survey and they found out that, yeah, 50% of people who are strong believers are not going to Sunday service. They're reading the Bible, they're praying, they're not backsliding. They're trying to serve God the, the best way they, they can. But then they made another question. Why are you not going to Sunday every Sunday? You know what the 91% answer was? Because I was hurt by these people. 
Now, I, I, when, 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 I, when we saw that study, you have to cry because Jesus said very enthusiastically and full of joy, I'm going to build my ecclesia. Oops, another side effect. <laughs> I'm going to build my ecclesia. And when you see that, what would he think? What the Holy Spirit feels or, or is happening? He's sad, of course. We, the hope of the earth as light and as salt, are not doing our job in that sense. So I talked to a good friend of mine about four or five years ago and, and told him the, about that, and he's a well-respected Baptist theologian. He has influence all over the nation, and he was intrigued by the whole thing. And he, he said, you know what, Poncho? We have seen a lot of people, I have seen a lot of people in my country that are not going to church neither. neither. I can say the same thing in my house, in my city, and in New Mexico. I know a lot of people that they don't want to do it anymore. The second reason was because I've been disillusioned by the pastor. Because he ended up going with another lady, stole money, criticized this other pastor, and they went to court and, and, and they said, I don't, I'm not going to follow these people. I prefer to be at home. And then the other thing, again, is this. I am a member of the Digital Ecclesia. To me, that doesn't exist. <laughs> but people are saying that. Uh, they said, I can see any sermon of any part of the world that I want to in my house, drinking, hopefully, tea, sometimes a beer. <laughs> so, 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 that's, so, so he made a survey. He took him two years to do a survey in Argentina. And then he calls me, Poncho, guess what I found? And I said, don't tell me. He said, yes. And he said, how many, th how many people do you think we discovered that are not coming to Sunday service anymore? And I said, you, you've been having a revival almost for 40 years? It started with Omar Cabrera and then Carlos Anaconda and Claudio Frisen and so many things that happened in Argentina. And I said, 20 percent. He said, no, higher. 40, higher. 50, higher. He said, 65 percent. We don't have statistics in Mexico. I don't know if you have the statistics. But that, that, that's something that is happening. Another thing that is happening is that the new generation, the millennials, we have studied seven surveys in different countries, and this is the, the summary. The summary is this, this generation, the millennials, first of all, is a, a generation larger than the baby boomers. I'm a baby boom generation. They call us baby boom because there was an increase in babies all over the world. I don't know what happened. All the TVs didn't work. I don't know what happened, but, but there was a boom of babies. <laughs> <laughs> in the United States, which they have a lot of information, they, they, there were 30 million people that were born in that part of history. And if you study other countries, there was this boom of babies. Well, this generation, the millennials, just in the United States, if, if, if the baby boomers were 30 million, you know how many millennials were born? Close to 80 million. Much larger than the baby boomer generation. And when you study what's happening in other parts of the world, it's the same thing. This millennials is a larger generation than the baby boom generation all over the world. Not all of the countries go to the same thing, but it's something similar. Well, this is what these guys are saying in the service. We want to know God. Now, don't think Jesus. We would like for them to think we want to, we want to know Jesus. No, they say we want to know God. We want to have an experience with him or with it or whatever it is. We, have a, we want to have a real experience not watch stuff. And when they started asking the questions, would you go to a church? You know what they, they answer in some of the, ans the, of the, the answers of, of some of the service are? They say, we want to meet God, we want to experience God, we want to know him, we want to whatever, but we hate the church. That was the word. We hate. Don't, get, don't think that I'm going to go to your four walls and do what you do. I'm a different mindset. One of the things that they discovered, this is very interesting, this generation is not loyal to branding. <laughs> the, the, the world, the economic world, the businesses were, were turned upside down with this generation. Because you know what toothpaste I use? Up until this day, the one my parents use at home. I never questioned it. I just, I got married, I need a toothpaste, toothpaste. I, I would buy the one I, I used. This generation, 
They don't care which toothpaste you use. They're going to see the label. If it's organic, if, have, if he has this element, if this if it's helping the people who don't have water, if it, and then they make a selection. So the companies like Coca-Cola and all those companies are saying, what are we going to do? People are not buying stuff because their parents did. We had to go and market differently to these people. They have spent millions of dollars, stuff like that. Now, why I'm saying that is this, because the, 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 the business community do their job. They study the culture. They study the generation. They found out what's wrong. They found out how we're going to get our product, and we have to package it in a different way. The ecclesia, the church, we're still doing the same thing we did 50 years ago. And not only that, we're not even aware of what this generation is thinking. So, Pastor Jimmy was saying, if we continue doing the same thing, expecting to have different results, that's crazy. You know who said that? Einstein. Einstein said, this is what madness is. Do the same thing and expect different results. Einstein. <laughs> so, it is the time to change the way we do things. Not the message. Not the message. That never changes. That Jesus gospel. But we need to package it differently. Amen. We need to understand what's going on. And, and I'm not saying don't do what we do. We still do it. But we need to start reaching out. So I have five minutes. <laughs> Let me just finish this uh, with, 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 with this thing about the cartels. So, Pablo Escobar, when, 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 when Los Pepes and, and the Cali cartel, the Rodriguez Orejuela cartel killed Pablo Escobar, this cartel with the 40 drug lords, Los Pepes, get the, the, the wife of Pablo Escobar and, his, and, and, her, and her, own, her oldest son, and he said, you need to come to a meeting where you're going to have to give us all the money that Pablo Escobar has, all the lands and all that, which was worth too close to more than $2 billion dollars. Because we won the war and now we own that property, and if you keep up that, we're going to kill you. And you had to come to the meeting with the 40 drug lords and, the, when, and with the whole cartel. And he said, and you had to bring your, your son because we're, we're going to kill him. We're gonna let, we're gonna not, we, we are not going to allow another Pablo Escobar to raise up, so we're going to kill him. So the mom and Pablo Escobar Jr., they said, what should we do? And Pablo is 16 years old at that time. When he knew that they killed his dad, he made a vow in, in the news saying, I'm going to kill the ones who killed my dad. So they go to a meeting. The night Pablo Escobar Jr. goes to the meeting, he prays and prays and prays and said, God, don't let this happen. This was not a religious man. So when they, they go to the meeting, they had to hand in every single dollar they had. And by God's miracle, they spare his life. So Pablo Jr. says, I'm not going to follow my dad's footsteps. In fact, I love him. He was a great dad for me. But I'm going to send a message to the world that this doesn't pay. All the movies and the series that there, there are right now, 19 of them, are, are being shown in all of the world, in, all, in the whole world. And now there's a movement of kids who wants to be Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar Jr. was telling me, I'm receiving emails and, 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 and WhatsApps from people from Uganda, North Korea, young kids that are saying, hey, I know that you're, you're the son of Pablo Escobar. How can I become him? And you're talking about cultures that cartels, they don't exist. I mean, there's a drug trafficking and all that, but, but this is a Latin American culture. And now we're saying people from Africa want to become Pablo Escobar, and people from Asia want to become Pablo Escobar. It, it's, these guys are disciples in the whole world. Well, Pablo Escobar, you know, says, I'm, I'm not going to do it. And in fact, what I'm going to do is gonna, I'm going to look for the people, the sons, the children of the people my, my dad killed, and I'm going to ask him forgiveness. Then the other cartel, the Rodriguez Orejuela cartel, when, when this whole situation is going on, the government comes against them. Of course, they knew who they were and where they live and all that. They come against them, and another cartel raises up, the cartel of the valley. 
So this cartel goes down. But these people are intelligent, and they say, I'm not going to die like a dog, like Pablo Escobar. We're going to go and, 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 and give up ourselves in to the United States. And they go, and they take their money, and they give the United States $1.6 billion, two brothers. The United States takes the money and says, we're going to give you a prison of 30 years. These two guys are in prison right now. They're going to be out in four years. They're going to be around 90 years old, and they're going to become U.S. citizens. So they went out through the law of the land, and they did what they had to do, two different messages. Well, the son of these guys, the oldest son, the other one has girls, but, but uh, one of them has, has one oldest son whose name is William. William, he's the, he's the third in line to get the leadership of the whole cartel. But an amazing thing happens. He comes to the Lord. <laughs> and now he's saying, I'm going to send a message to the world that this doesn't pay, that this is not going to work. Well, two months ago, these two guys called me and said, Poncho, can you help us have a meeting so it will be international news where we can reconcile both of us and send a message to the world that the way we need to, to fight drug trafficking and even drug using is through forgiveness, love. We have never done that in any part of the world. The United States has spent $40 billion in 40 years to stop drug users. And if you've studied the statistics 40, year, 40 years ago, is here, the, the addiction of the nation. 40 years later, after spending $40 billion, the addiction is way here. We have never tried to fight drug addiction and drug trafficking through a message of love, repentance, because that means forgiveness, reconciliation, instead of you kill me, I kill you, I kill you, you kill me, and that's, the, well, that's what happens, and that's what's happening here. That's what happened all over the world. So for the first time in the world, there's going to be a message saying, let's fight this thing, not with guns, not with more police, but with reconciliation. Let allow God and his kingdom to come to these places. So we're planning from the 21st of September, the Lord willing, we're going to invite these two guys in Juarez, right at the border, because William is still paying. He, he, he gave himself in, in the United States courts. They gave him 10 years. He got out after five because of good conduct, but he cannot come out of the United States. Now, Pablo Escobar Jr. cannot come into the United States. He's, he's not being persecuted. He doesn't have an order of arrest, but they're never going to give him a visa because he's the son of Pablo Escobar. So we're going to meet right at the border, and we're going to have an international event. The news, uh, uh, we already confirmed CBS, NBC, Fox, I mean, uh, BBC. They're going to be there because they want to see how these two guys talk to each other and forgive each other, send a message of love and forgiveness <laughs> to the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm going to finish in, in two minutes. So when they call me, their idea was to have an event. And then I'm thinking, Ecclesia, Disciple Nations. And I said, guys, let's not do an event. Let's create a movement. Amen. Let's become the Ecclesia all over the world. Yes. So right now we're working on the project to once we do that, have the same meeting in all the borderline between Mexico and the United States, then have in 40 prisons, the worst prisons in Juarez, in Mexico, and then go all over the world. These two guys together, sending the message. Who would be more authorized to talk about this? You see, we, we could have been reading the news right now, talking about these two guys killing each other and killing a lot of people. But they decided not to follow the simple way of their parents. They decided to start afresh through repentance, forgiveness, love. Doesn't it sound like a moment for the ecclesia? You see... God, I believe that's what, what, what my brother was saying. I believe God is going to move, is moving, and he's going to move, as he moved from Jerusalem to Antioch, he's going to move from the four walls to the marketplace. And we're going to see things like this, and this guy is going to be ministering what we could have never done it, because the solution for the poor are the poor in Christ. The solution to the gangs, gangsters are the gangsters in Christ, 
the solution to drug trafficking are the drug traffickers in Christ? We need to understand that. These are the most qualified people to talk about the whole issue because they were there and their testimonies are real and they are respected by the people who are doing the same thing. So just think about it. Uh, sooner or later, there's going to be a web page all over the world where people can, can write to these guys and say, help me. So we, 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 we're planning to have seminaries and whatever we can so people can take it home and then start thinking and being disciple of forgiveness, love. And we're going to reach to a lot of people who are not Christian yet, but they're going to meet the Savior through the Ecclesia. To me, that could be part of the Ecclesia. Now, where, where are they going to have fellowship? I don't know. And you know what? I don't care. <laughs> They need, a, they need to congregate. They need a pastor. But that's not the issue. God is going to take care of that because he's building his church, his ecclesia. And just to finish, a month ago, I have a call from uh, what is known as the, well, this is, this, is, this is Pablo Jr. He's about 40 years old. This is William, almost same age. And uh, this is the bridge where we're going to have the event, likely. As I go back, I need to I have a meeting with the Homeland Security Government Agency from the United States to ask for permission to do this. Now, it, we don't know if it's going to happen or not, but if God sent us there, it's because he's coming, so he's going to show up, and, and, and we're going to have the permit. <laughs> and uh, so, so the, the World Organization for Peace calls me a month ago, and he says, Poncho, we would like to invite you to be our delegate of this international worldwide organization in the state of Chihuahua. And I'm going like, okay. <laughs> I wasn't even aware. I mean, I knew that this organization existed, like, like the World Organization for, for Health. There's a World Organization for Peace. 120 countries this organization is. So they asked me to be the delegate of this organization in the state of Chihuahua. They don't know anything about this, and I don't know anything about them. So I go to the, to the headquarters, international, the worldwide headquarters, and they give me an assignment to be the delegate. And they told me, when you're here, we want to ask you one more thing, but we need to do it personally. And I'm gonna, like, what are you talking about? So I'm there, they give me my, my papers or whatever, you know, to represent the worldwide organization in my province. And then they say, we would like to invite you to be member of the Honorable Council, the Worldwide Honorable Council of the World Organization for Peace. And I'm going like, what is that? <laughs> and, and I asked him, what, what is that? He said, well, this is the World Council. If a third world war starts, this is the first people they're going to interview. And, and I said, who's in this, in this committee, in this, in this uh, honorable council? They said, well, Mr. Mandela was there, Jimmy Carter, Mikhail Gorbachev. And I, and I said, stop, stop, stop. I said, uh, uh, do you know who you're talking to? And I said, honestly, that's not my league. I mean, I don't play in that, in that league. I'm, I'm just poncho. <laughs> and I said, thank you for the invitation, but I think you're, you, where do you get my name? <laughs> but they say, we have follow your story, and we know that you could be and should be a, a, a wisdom counselor to the whole world. So... <laughs> So, I don't take anything from granted. I, I don't deserve to be there. What I'm doing is because God's grace, but it's this size. But again, it's not my story. It's his story. If he wants to do that, I said, Lord, help me. I will be there. And which better organization to be part of? World Organization for Peace. I serve and we serve the Prince of Peace. God has given us, the Ecclesia, the Ministry of Reconciliation. Now, a non-religious organization is opening the door. I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. I bring the kingdom. So pray for me. Uh, they, they, they're working on the paperwork, and then they're going to be official in a few uh, weeks. But again, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about for God, please, to reconcile all things through Jesus Christ. Things in heaven and things on earth. God is opening doors for the ecclesia to be involved in all these places. That's my, what he's doing in my life. 
But my question is, what does is God already had prepared in your life, in his story, not your story, in his story? I think it's going to be amazing. I think it's the new, next move of the Holy Spirit. I think we're going to see that happening. And hopefully, and I pray that we will not be jealous about the how many people are going to use and not us. Because let me just close with this, and this is sad. The next thing that God, the next movement of God, you know who the main persecutors are? The previous movement of God. These are the guys who don't like these guys and start working against them. Jews, Jesus sent Jesus, Christians. Just think about what happened with, with the Catholics. The Catholics were all over the world. They had a message. They mixed it. They missed it, but then Jesus raised up Martin Luther King. Who was the main guys who persecuted Martin Luther King? The Catholics. Now then, the Anabaptists come, and now the message is baptism by adults. Who are the ones who, who put chains on the Anabaptists and, and take them to legs and send them to the water to die, mocking them? That's your water baptism. The Lutherans. And you go in history, and that's the way we, the Ecclesia, act. Because we haven't understand that there's only one church. We're not fighting against each other. So when God is doing, I believe God is going to do this all over the world. I hope and I pray that us, the established church right now, are, gonna, are not going to come up against so many people that are going to be ordained by God, not by institutions, and they're going to reach out to millions. And we're going to say, yeah, but they don't have this, they don't have that. Be careful. Because God is building his ecclesia in our house. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you.